Good, now won't you turn in the scriptures to Acts chapter 2. Open your Bible there. Book of Acts in the New Testament, uh, chapter 2. Something amazing happened in Jerusalem just 53 days after the crucifixion. You remember the timeline, crucifixion, three days later, resurrection, 40 days later, ascension, 10 days later, Pentecost. I was never very good at maths at school. I won't tell you what my mark for maths in matric was. That is a family secret. (laughs) Nobody will ever know except my family, and they still love me. (laughs) But adding all of that up, it's 53 days. That I can do. And 53 days after Jesus Christ was crucified in Jerusalem by the Romans at the instigation of the Jewish leaders with the support of a company of Jews, we don't know how many, who cried out, crucify him, crucify him, when Pilate wanted to release him. He carried his cross to a hill outside the city of Jerusalem and there he was crucified. 53 days after that in the same city 3,000 people were publicly baptized in an open space in that, in that very city where that had happened, 3,000 people were publicly baptized. It wasn't in a church like we're going to baptize today, surrounded by sympathetic believers, family, and friends. It was in a public place in a city where 53 days before, Jesus had been crucified by the religious leaders and the Romans. Let me read from verse 36. Look at your text if you have it in front of you. Peter the Apostle preached on that day to a crowd that was gathered together as a result of strange phenomena, a rushing mighty wind, tongues of fire, All sorts of weird stuff happened to signify the coming of the Holy Spirit in a new way. And to this crowd, Peter spoke about Jesus right from the beginning of his life through to the end of his life and his ascension to heaven. And he backed it all up with Old Testament scriptures that his audience knew well. And when he reached the punchline of his sermon, this is what he said. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And then this, verse 41. 
those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So these people, as I said, were publicly baptized in Jerusalem 53 days after the crucifixion. They heard the message about Jesus, who he was, what he'd done about his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension. They heard that from the mouth of the Apostle Peter. As they heard it, the Holy Spirit worked in their hearts. It says they were cut to the heart. They were stabbed to the heart. They felt their need. And they said, what do we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. Being baptized is an outward act that signifies an inward faith. Nobody is forgiven by getting wet. That's symbolic of something deeper and richer. Be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So baptism is an outward witness to an inward faith. It's an outward witness that something significant has happened inside a person. And that significant thing involves two things. It involves sins being forgiven, and that's pictured in the washing, and it's receiving of the Holy Spirit. Peter said, repent and believe. Baptism being the outward evidence of belief. Your sins will be forgiven and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, by being baptized, those people on that day were publicly acknowledging that they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the promised Messiah, they were publicly acknowledging that they had been forgiven and had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And baptism was like a public witness, an outward witness to what had happened inside. It was almost as if they, almost as if in their baptism, by their baptism, they put on a t shirt that said, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And then they walked around in Jerusalem 53 days after Jesus' crucifixion. They walked around wearing that t-shirt, acknowledging that they believed in Jesus and that they committed themselves to follow him. That's how public it was. That's how courageous it was in that context. And that, and that indicates that something deep and life-transforming life had happened inside of them for them to be willing in that context to identify themselves with Jesus Christ. And so what's the point of baptism? Baptism is about identification. By being baptized, you are identifying yourself as a follower of Jesus. That's the outward dimension to it. So baptism is identification with the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. If you have your Bible, just move on from Acts to, to Romans, the next book in the New Testament. Find your way to Romans chapter 6 because Acts chapter 2 tells us what they did outwardly. Romans chapter 6 explains what happened inwardly. Romans chapter 6, let's just break in at verse 3, where Paul says, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now I want you to notice as you look at those verses, and this is important, even though the word baptized is used three times, 
There's no water in these verses. Because they're not talking about a physical baptism. They're talking about an inward baptism. Listen to it again. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, when is a person baptized into Christ? When they repent and believe in Christ. When their sins are forgiven, they receive the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be baptized into Christ. If you look at verse 5, he uses another word. He says, for if we have been united with him. So what does it mean to be baptized into Christ? It means to be united to him. And water baptism is just the outward witness to the inward baptism into Christ. The inward union with Christ. Because when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, his death is counted as your death. His burial is counted as your burial. His resurrection is counted as your resurrection. All his work is given to you. And you're saved through what he did. That's the meaning of baptism. It's about identification. And water baptism symbolizes spiritual baptism. And it's, it's appropriate because going under the water pictures death and burial coming up out of the water pictures resurrection and I promise those of you who are baptizing today Keith and I are not going to keep you under <laughs> you know we're going to finish the job we're going to bring you up again and that, and that symbolizes uh, I mean Keith you haven't spent all this money on Jethro up to now to just kind of <laughs> keep him under there it symbolizes, symbolic of a spiritual <laughs> salvation that is rooted in what Jesus did on our behalf. And then there's another aspect of, of, of identification that is important. It's not only, baptism not only means identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, it also <coughs> means identification with the church in its character and mission. And here, look again, go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 47. I beg your pardon, verse 41. We read it earlier. Those who accepted his message, the message of Peter, the message of the gospel, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were, did you get, get this? about 3,000 were added to their number. <coughs> Talking about there's a community. There was already a community of followers of Jesus, but now on that day, that community was significantly added to by this crop of new converts, 3,000 of them. And what does uh, the writer say? they were added to the number of those who were already disciples of Jesus. And what did they do? Carry on reading from the next verse. This group of people, of baptized individuals, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. So this new community, those were the things that they did. They devoted themselves to those things. And then if you look down at the end of verse 47, it says, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so what you have is the emergence of a community. And that community is called the, the church. That's right. The church. A community of those who are saved. And just as in the case of identification, there's also the identification not only with Christ but also with the church. So when it comes to uh, when it comes to the identification, it's not only with Christ, but it's also with the church. And there's an inward aspect as well. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians. Acts, Romans, Corinthians is next. This is not this is an easy day. 
Turn, turn uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Find your way there, the next book in the New Testament. Chapter 12, verse 12. And here the Apostle Paul is talking about the church and he's explaining what the church is and he's using the most common New Testament illustration of the church, which is our body. Your body, my body, is an illustration of what the church is. Let me read from verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the Apostle Paul says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. I mean, that's biology 101. All that there is of you is here today. You know, you didn't leave your liver on the dining room table as you, as you, as you walked out. I mean, there is nothing of you that isn't here, that isn't connected, that doesn't belong together. And so he's using this as an illustration of the church. And he says, just as the body, though one has many parts and all its parts, all its many parts form one body, then he adds this, so it is with Christ. So he's using the human body as an illustration of Christ and his body, the church. Verse 13, now he's explaining how this came about. Listen carefully, this is critical. How did, this come about? How did this come about? How did you become part of this body? Verse 13, For we were all baptized. There's that word again. For we were all baptized by one spirit. We counted the Holy Spirit before, remember? We were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, is just saying, it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what your ethnic background is. Doesn't matter whether you're male or female. Doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. Doesn't matter whether you're educated or uneducated. We were all baptized by one spirit into one body. And then he says, we were all given the one spirit to drink. What does that mean? Does that mean that the Holy Spirit is a liquid? No, he's using it, again, he's using an illustration. We all, in other words, you say, we all receive the same Holy Spirit. When you drink something, you receive it. You take it into you. So he's using this as an illustration, a picture. We all receive the same Holy Spirit. You know what happens when people receive the same Holy Spirit? It unites them together. Same Holy Spirit in me is in John Wilson. That's what unites us together. I mean, aside from our good looks, that we have that in common. That's what binds us together. You know, we may live in the same complex, but that's not what binds us together. Our deepest relationship is because the same Holy Spirit that lives in John lives in me and lives in every other believer. And that's what makes, so, that, so the, the life of Lee Robert, the life is in this body. It inhabits my whole body. And when I die, my soul departs this body. I won't leave part of, the, part of that life behind. I'll be dirt. But the life permeates and enlivens my whole body. In the same way, the Holy Spirit gives life to the whole body of Christ, the church. When then does a person become a member of the church of Jesus Christ? When you hear the gospel, when you feel your need of Christ, when you repent of your sins and believe in Jesus, your sins are forgiven, you receive the Holy Spirit, and it is the receiving of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that connects you with the church. So you become a member of the church in a universal sense at your conversion. So identification. Baptism, what's the point of baptism? It's about identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's about identification with the church in its nature 
body and its mission, because the body is on earth for a purpose. If we didn't have a mission, the Lord would just take us on to heaven after we got converted. Now, one more thing. What's the point of the church? Identification. Number two, intention. Intention. By the, to those of you who've been baptized today, the six of you, listen to me carefully. By being baptized today, you are stating your intention. You are publicly saying something to the rest of us. You're saying, it is my intention to take up my cross and to follow Jesus in a life of discipleship. That's what you're saying. Just as when a couple gets married, the heart of marriage, right, is that moment when I turn to the couple, if I'm marrying them, I'll look at them and I'll say, turn and face each other and hold hands. And they will turn and they will face each other and they'll look at each other like this and I'll say, repeat after me. And they repeat their vows and they say, I, I, I say, do you take so and so to be your wife? Do you take so and so to be your husband? And they say, I do. And they say, I promise to love, honor and cherish you until death parts us. What are they doing? They're stating an intention. That's their, that's their commitment. Publicly making that commitment. And, and guys that have been baptized today, there's a sense in which you in front of us are saying to us, it is my intention to take up my cross and to follow Jesus every day for the rest of my life. Will you do it perfectly? No. No. Just as in a marriage, on our wedding day, I promise to love, honor, and cherish Irene until death do us part. Have I loved her perfectly? Have I honored her perfectly? Have I cherished her, cherished her perfectly? No. And has she me? Yeah. No, she hasn't. <laughs> because we're sinners. But that's how we live our lives every day. That's our intention. And that's what it means. That's what you're saying to us today. I intend to follow Jesus in a life of discipleship. Jesus made this very clear. And when we get into Luke down the road, we're going we're gonna to hit this again and again and again. Listen to this little sample from Luke 14. Jesus said, If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, even his own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. I mean, he was pretty straight about it. He's saying, you've got to put me above your father, above your mother, above your wife, above your children, above your friends, above everything else. Not prepared to do that, you can't be my disciple. I mean, it's all or nothing. And so you're saying to us today, it's my intention to follow Jesus that way. And then, second, you're saying it's my intention to play my part in the life and mission of the church. That's what you're saying. It's my intention to play my part in the life and mission of the church. Guys, baptism is not some private little deal between you and Jesus. It isn't. You are identifying yourself with the body of Christ and so at the same time you're saying it is my intention to be committed to this body and to its mission for the rest of my life. Doesn't mean you can't be an engineer. Doesn't mean you can't be a neuroscientist. Doesn't mean you can't be an author doesn't mean you, you can do all of those things and at the same time be involved in the mission of Jesus Christ. And so baptism, it's a pretty serious deal, wouldn't you say? Because you are publicly saying it is my intention to follow Jesus in a life of discipleship. It is my intention to be committed to 
his church and to its mission. Just as when Irene and I were married 46 years ago, we stood before our pastor and the thousand guests that we had at our wedding. They didn't all come to the reception, thankfully. <laughs> but they came to celebrate with us. We said before all of them, it is our intention to be all into this relationship for the rest of our lives. And that's what you're saying to us about Jesus. Now I wonder, if I had a free t-shirt for every one here who claims to be a follower of Christ, and at the end as you went out the gate, I gave you a t-shirt, and on the front it said, I'm a follower of Jesus. And on the back it said, I'm proud to be part of the church. And I said, you've got to wear that every day for the next two weeks. How are you feeling? Walking to work tomorrow morning, I'm, I believe in Jesus. Oh, I go to church. That's really what you're saying today putting on that, by baptism, you're putting on that t-shirt. Think of those guys in Jerusalem. They hear this message. Ugh. They feel their need. They, they realize that they've sinned. They, they, they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And Peter says, okay, put your money where your mouth is. Get baptized. And they come out of that water, probably in the pool of Siloam, one of the big pools in the city of Jerusalem. And people know, you're one of the baptized ones. Ah. In Jerusalem, 53 days after Jesus was brutally crucified. Sure. You only do that if something seriously significant has happened in your heart. So there we go. What's the point of baptism? Identification and intention. I'm going to pray. We'll get changed. We'll sing a couple of songs and then we'll have the baptisms. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are still doing what you did in that day, on that day in Jerusalem through your word, you are calling people to repent and believe. You're still forgiving sin. You're still granting the gift of the Holy Spirit. You're still changing lives. Thank you for those who today in baptism will bear witness to their identification with you and to their intention to follow you all the days of their life. Bless them now in this act of obedience and us as we witness it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.